A good morning to you all. Thank you very much for joining this broiler business webinar. Most broiler farmers understand that the ability of their businesses to earn strong returns is greatest, especially when they keep their production costs below their income and if they enhance efficiency. But how do we keep the production costs very, very low? We need to look at feed efficiency since it's a cost that constitutes the highest percentage of our production cost. We also need to look at any other innovative solutions or ways that can improve your, your broiler business. So these are the key areas that we are going to look at today. And the main aim of this webinar is to help with ideas on how you can improve uh, your broiler business especially looking at the feed uh, efficiency and also any innovative solutions that can be adopted in terms of uh, improving your, your broiler business. So today we are joined by Blantina Mutago. She's from National Foods and we also have Norma Moyo. She's from Agro Poultry Supplies and Veterinary Services. So let's go straight into the business of the day. We invite Blantina Mutsago. She will cover gaining the age in umbrella business, housing, health, and feed. It's okay. How are you, our listeners? Thank you for joining us into our today's training or discussion. Uh, yeah, umbrella management is a bit tricky, you know, and we really want to thank agribusiness media for giving us this platform to share ideas and tips to our farmers out there. And the most important thing in broiler management is management itself. Because most of the farmers, they do shortcuts. Some, they, they keep their houses in, in their spare bedrooms. Some, they do that in boxes, of which there are so many things that are needed or required by broilers for the management to be on point or for the management to be productive. So to start with, we need to talk about housing itself. Where am I allowed or where am I expected to keep my chickens? Where am I expected to rear my broilers in order to have a, a productive project, in order to have a productive project and a, a maximum income? from my project. So in order to have a good and a proper management of your broilers, first thing is to have a required and a proper poultry house. Why do we need a proper poultry house? We need a proper poultry house that can enable us to maintain the required temperatures in the brooder and in the rearing house. Also, we need a pot house that can enable us to have enough and proper ventilation to our beds. Because these things that I have picked can make us lose all the money that we invest in our project or multiply and grow according to how are you doing it and where are you keeping your chicks. So a poultry house that we need or that we expect our farmers to have must be built in an east to west orientation. Our poultry house should be built in an east to west orientation, meaning the eastern and western side should be built from the floor or from the ground up to the roof. We expect the east and western side to be built from the floor or from the ground up to the, to the roof. And the northern and southern side should be built just 50 centimeters. Northern and south must be built just 50 centimeters using your bricks and the rest you should put a wire mesh. The rest you should put a wire mesh. This is the amount of air that we need in our poultry house. 
Mr. Lens, I can't see my slides. This is the amount of air that we require in our poultry house. So the the height of the poultry house must be at least 2.6 meters on the higher side of a flat roof. Why do we need this height? We need all the attendants of our poultry, of our chickens, of our beds to be able to walk in freely, to be able to feed, to put water, to check on temperature, check on ventilation, in a way that they will be comfortable and free. Because if they are not comfortable, you are guaranteed that they will not be able to go in and out that frequently to check for the temperature, to check for the performance, to check for the feed, check for the water, if all are available. Then the roof overlap must be 30 centimeters. The roof overlap must be 30 centimeters. We don't need during normally during rain season, we don't want water to come just directly to our walls, our our walls so that the water will not get into our pot shelves. So to avoid that, we put a roof overlap of 30 centimeters. Then all the brick surfaces must be plastered. Why are we plastering the roof surfaces? We need to, to be able to clean our poultry house effectively and freely. We need to make sure that every wall is cleaned and disinfected, and disinfected properly. And the, con the floors must be of concrete or we expect concrete floors. Again, this will allow us to clean properly and disinfect our poultry houses. Then size of a house should carry the appropriate number of chicks or the size of the house should match the number of chickens that you are going to keep in that poultry house, which we call our stocking density. So our required stocking density is 10 to 12 beds per square meter. Required stocking density is 10 to 12 beds per square meter. Please note, we should not exceed or put anything less than the required, meaning you need to strictly stick to 10 to 12 beds per square meter. This is how our poultry house should be built. So we, it doesn't matter how many beds you are keeping. This is the challenges that we face with small scale farmers. Someone will tell you, ah, Valentina, I just have 50 chicks. Can I build a, a poultry house for just 50 beds? You need to build a proper poultry house despite the number of chicks that you are keeping. So even if you are keeping 50 beds, your guideline will be your stocking density, which is 10 to 12 beds per square meter. This will now guide you how big my poultry house should be and how big my poultry house should be built like. So this is the illustration of what I was talking about. If we can see the east western side is built to the roof and is plastered. Then the, the north and south sides, we have a 50 centimeters brick wall and 2.6 height. This is what in picture a poultry house should look like. This is what we expect our poultry houses to be look look like and again I, I repeat it doesn't matter how many beds you have even if you have two beds let's build a proper pot house this is how we begin to practice the proper management or the required broiler management as we go as we grow now you will be able to do the proper things and your project will grow therefore our profits will grow this is for our small scale farmers. Like I told you, it doesn't matter how many beds you are keeping. And these pictures, we, we take them from your fellow farmers. This one is the walls are not plastered, yes, but at least the farmer improvised and the farmer is doing 
exactly what we expected. So you can't do all the things over the night. It is important to do slowly bit by bit or you take stage by stage until you get there. If we check on this farmer, she, he or she built it a proper poultry house. Next time she will be able to plaster the poultry house and it will become a standard poultry house. So for our small scale farmers, we can use flat roofs. This is an example of a poultry house for small scale farmers. So it doesn't matter how many beds you are, you can do this on your plots or at your homes, provided the space is there and the space is enough to build these pottery houses. If the space is, is, is not enough, I advise let's look for bigger spaces and do the proper thing. It will not make sense or it will not do you right to just say, I'll just do my project, even if I don't have the required space, because you have so many, you will have so many challenges challenges, so many problems that will come along with, with those decisions. So we need to make sure we have space to build our pottery houses and we do the proper thing from start. Because this is where the project starts from. If we fail here, then we are going to have problems in maintaining the temperatures. We are going to have problems in keeping our bedding dry. We are going to have problems in having enough ventilation or air circulation. So we need to do the proper thing from the first. And for commercial or large scale farmers, we now use hip de roofs for our, for our poultry houses. So this is the example of a hip de roof poultry house for our commercial and large scale farmers. Again, if you want to be there or if you are already a large or commercial farmer, this is what we expect to see at your farm. So broiler management at large, we might need a whole day. But as agribusiness media said, we are focusing on few topics. But what I can say is, please farmers, management must be on point. You need to check first things first. You need to check if your equipment is on place before you go and purchase or do your placement for your chicks. So number one, you need to check if your equipment is still working. This is done before placement. Normally I say, check your equipment a week before. We know our placing calendars. We know when are we expect to receive um, new babies or new children. Chicks. So first thing you need to check if your equipment is, is still intact, if your equipment is still working. When I'm talking about equipment, I'm talking about your drinkers. Are your drinkers enough? Are your drinkers still working? Are your feeders enough? Are your feeders still working? Is your curtaining in place? Is it clean? Is it disinfectant? Because all these things that I'm pointing out, they lead into diseases, they lead into problems that we cannot or we will have challenges to deal with. They will also lead to some conditions that will get, that will be difficult to deal with. So we need to check if these things are in place. Bedding, is my bedding in place already? Then I'm sorry, Comrade Rollins, I'm a bit of going off what you have asked me to do, but I need to say this. Even if you, your, your brooder, you need to prepare your brooder on time. You don't just go and pick your chicks from your distributors and come and you start now to put bedding, you start putting feed, you start putting water whilst your chicks are on the ground or on farm already. This must be done before you, you go to take your chicks or before placement. So these, I call them preparations prior to placement. So before you place your chicks, check your equipment, check your heating system. Also, take note of the weather. And now we are in winter, so you need to take note of the weather. The heating source that I have, is it enough according to the weather at the moment or according to season that I am with? So that is very important. You need to check that. Also, 
is your if you are using baura is your charcoal okay or enough for you to use them throughout the brooding season which is two weeks in summer and three weeks in winter also you need to check if your infrared are still working that is if you are using infrared for for heating that must be checked before your cheeks come or before you bless your cheeks your bedding you need to put the required thickness of bedding because what does bedding do bedding provides an insulation between the floor and the feet of your cheek meaning your your cheek should be on on a bedding which can provide heat on them in order for them not to catch cold so you need to check all these things it's not just a matter of covering a ground with some grass or some wood shavings no you need to put a proper thickness of the bedding that we require for the cheeks to be warm so just to run through it we require you to have five to seven centimeters or to put five to seven centimeter thickness of your bedding so this is these are the some of the tips that are very important but i will not be able to talk much in detail because of our time mkoma rollins will share my details and we can continue to assist each other and the other important thing after all is said and done we need to protect our cheeks from diseases which lends us on our topic of biosecurity so we need to know what is biosecurity as we all know bio means life secure or to come into your science number one i know most of farmers you don't want to hear this but this is very important we do not need multi-age groups on one side we do not need to multi age groups on one side i have my pottery house which can accommodate for example i have my pottery house which can accommodate 1000 chicks so my market to require me to produce or to supply under 200 beds this week 200 beds next week or 200 beds after every two weeks so what i'll do is i will now in the in that very same pottery house i'll demarcate it and it into five and put 200 here the next demarcation 200 the next 200 that is not allowed why we if one one batch have a problem it means all the other following batches will have the same problem that the first one has normally the smaller edge will be affected compared to the bigger beds. So to avoid this, we do not need multi-edge groups on one side. We must practice all in or out in all our beaches. Then number two, different types of pottery on one side. For example, you have your layers, you have your broilers, you have your indigenous chickens that our road runners on one side farmers that is not allowed why our brailers have a, a short lifespan if we can check most of us we keep them for 35 days that's what, five weeks or if we exceed depending on which feeds feed types are you using for straight feeds we say 35 days and for concentrated stretches to 42 days so if you compare this with layers and road runners these beds have a long lifespan meaning they will they have a system that can resist some diseases also most of the diseases they will be vaccinated against if we check vaccination program for layer it is a number of diseases that we vaccinate against against these that we vaccinate our layers but if we check for brailers we only have newcastle and infectious basal disease meaning all the other diseases that we vaccinate against our layers they can come and affect the broilers why because they are not uh, uh, vaccinated against those diseases their system is not well is not strong enough to fight 
against the other diseases that are seen on layers transmission program. So it means if we put them on one side, layers might have diseases that they can live with. And it's, but if you check broilers, they will get sick and die because of those diseases. So we do not put same beds, so types, different types of poultry on one side, because this will put our brailers on a disadvantage. And it means all our investment will be gone. So we do not need different types of poultry on one side. Why am I repeating this? Farmers, you don't want to hear about this. You want to make sure you have your roadrunners, you have your brailers, especially roadrunner and brailers. Please, you need to choose. If you are to stick to broiler management, please stick to broiler management. If you are stick to, if you are to stick with roadrunner management, please stick to roadrunner management. Because roadrunners, like I said, they is the same. They get vaccinated with many different diseases, and they are also carriers of some other diseases. Then number three, we do not need dead birds, wild birds, domestic animals in our site where we keep our broilers. We need to make sure that we properly dispose the dead birds. If your mortalities are there, mortalities can be found. It's a management of life thing. Things happen, your chicks can, can be sick and die. So we need to properly dispose of the dead birds. Number one, we do not leave them in the portals. You will visit someone telling you, I have 10 birds which have died and they will be in the same poultry house where your life beds are. This is not, or that is not acceptable. Why? Because if the disease that kills your beds is contagious, it means if you leave your dead beds there, the, the most definite thing is that the other life beds will be affected with that disease. So we need to make sure that as soon as we see mortalities, let's pick them out, let's go, either we burn them or we dig our holes and bury them far, far away from our poultry house, at least 300 meters if the spaces if the spaces allow. So we need to make sure we do a proper disposal of our, of our dead beds. Poor housing, like I said, poultry house is where everything starts. We need to, proper build, to properly build our poultry houses with the proper design we have talked about, east to west orientation, all that I have talked about, please let's stick to that because we need proper ventilation, we need insulation, and we do not need um, portals, which is difficult to clean. So we need to make sure that for all this to be achievable, we need a proper built poultry house. Then our equipment, our equipment must always be clean, must always be disinfectant, as well as motor vehicles. Please, let's not allow all sorts of people into our farms. Why? Because they transmit diseases. If Blantina comes from a house, maybe Blantina has road runners and they are affected with infectious coriza. Then I visit Mr. M's farm. They just allow me, allow me in into their farm never checked where I come from, do I have any other types of beds, then I get into your poultry house. I will now leave that infection in your poultry house. So let's always have our wheel beds on our entrance or our gates. We make sure, or if we do not have a wheel bed, at least let's put someone on an entrance who can spray all incoming vehicles so that we make sure our beds are safe and no one is bringing in any bacteria, any protozoa or any virus. We need to make sure our biosecurities are strictly being followed as well as your tools, your tools that's your drinkers, your feeders. After every batch, we need to clean using detergents and disinfect our drinkers. Then we leave them to dry and keep them in our storage rooms, which is also cleaned and safe. Then contaminated feed. 
we do not give contaminated feed to our beds. Let's make sure our feed is clean, our feed that is not contaminated, then lack of protective clothes. Yeah, you find it at some, at some farms, you see if not even one person with the overall or a check suit. It is very important to have overalls and check suit at your poultry house or at your farm, not just for your stockmen, stock hand men, but for visitors. If I come to your farm, I must find, find an overall that I can put on, which is clean, which you make sure you clean on your own, which you make sure you always spray some disinfectant after every visit so that you are sure my clothes or anything that I, I that I come from from where I am coming from to your to your farm is not affecting your bed so you should hear all your 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 your, your stock headmen must have their gum shoes must have their tricks work suits and all the visitors must have at least a, a work suit or an an on, on, on an overall jacket so that we can put on whilst visiting your poultry houses. So at the entrances of your poultry houses, we need to see a footpath. Why a footpath is important? I need to leave everything that I stick on my shoes whilst getting into my pot house. This is not just for the people who be hand or handling your chicks, but also even the owner of the project must get through or must dip your, your feet into the into the foot pot into the foot bath before you get in 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 your poultry house. So we need to see this. You see, you can always improvise. I always tell farmers, it's not about pumping out money. No, we can always improvise according to what we have on our farm. Look at this farmer. He used um, a 20 and 20 a bucket that they cut and use it as a as a footpath. So you can also do this at your farm. Some they make an, an inbuilt foot but you can build it on the door but some they can use this for for their foot but we need to see this on your entrances this is very important because whoever gets through you make sure you dip the you or she dip your foot into the foot bath and we put a disinfectant water with disinfectant in the foot bath we need to occasionally change it normally if you read on the disinfectant that you'll be using they write how often should i change the the water and how often should i clean and put fresh water with the disinfectant we need to always follow that then despite all other things that I have talked about, the most stressful and expensive thing is feed. We do not want to risk anything by giving our chickens or our beds a poor quality feed. So whenever I am doing my project, I need to make sure that I have saved my money. That allows me to go and buy feed from reputable suppliers. This will guarantee you quality. Farmers, we do not buy feed from streets. Please, we do not buy feed from streets. We buy feed from reputable suppliers. This will guarantee us good quality and good performance. So feed play an important role in the broiler management because for our broilers to grow, for our broilers to be able to gain weight that you always cry about, they should get a proper feed. So it is always important to buy from reputable suppliers. So for us to have a good FCR, which is our feed conversion ratio, when I'm saying feed conversion ratio, is the care, is the, um, it's, the amount of feed that is consumed by a bed or a kg of feed that can be converted into a kg of meat, this is our FCR. So we need to make sure that we make a good choice of, 
of feed. So at National Foods, we have two types of feed. Like I mentioned before, we have uh, pelleted feeds. That's our typhus one, typhus two, and typhus three. We always we also have our mesh feeds, which come in as our broiler concentrate. But if you check these two, there are two differences of using these feeds. Yes, the nutritional value might be the same, but there is more to that because if we check the pelleted feed is as high FCR compared to meshed feeds. And also the meshed feeds, there is a high or more spillage compared to pellet feed. So on in terms of FCR, if you check the bed uses 30% more energy to eat the same amount of feed that it can eat on, on pellets, meaning the pellets will now have a higher or will be more, meaning the bed will now be able to convert the feed into meat quickly compared to, to meshes. Also, the issue of wastage is a problem when you're using meshes. You need to make sure the person who is feeding is very responsible, as well as your feeders that you are using are good and they not spill, they will not spill your, your feed. So feed, feed wastage gives an incorrect picture of feed efficiency and feed performance because at some point you expect your bed to be for example 900 grams at week two is just an example i'm not saying those are the ways that must be achieved so it's, it's just an example but because you were spilling a lot of feed it means there's no way you're going to catch up with those weights. Why? Because the feed that were ingested by, by your bed will now be low or will now not be as per required. So we need to make sure that the type of feed that we are using and the type of equipment that I have and the type of my stock hand men that I have, they are also good and they do that in a proper way. Also molding and transitivity affects feed flavor. So we do not need molded feed or we should not give molded feed to our beds. Why? Because this affects flavor of our feed, not just the quality, but the flavor will also be affected. Beds can really Saints, or they can they know that this the taste has changed. They know that the the pellet size has changed. So we need to make sure that we keep our feed fresh so that this cannot affect the eating rate rate of our of our beds. Because if they if we give them more feed, they will not eat, which means that they will not grow. So we need to make sure our feed is in good in good quality. Then the presence of anti-nutritional factors inhibited inhibits digestion of dietary proteins. So we need to make sure again we keep and buy the feed which is balanced diet and also again we do not buy feed from streets. Then expired feed must never be fed to our to our beds. Some farmers, they do not even check expiry dates. You hear someone saying, ah, ah, I bought this feed last month and now it's expired. Can I give to my bed? It's a no, no. We need to check expiry date before we leave shops, before we leave our suppliers, our, our suppliers distribution points. Why? Because we do not feed expired products to our beds. If we do that, and the, the results also will be compromised. So if you feel you want to buy in bulk your feed, make sure you have checked on the expiry date and you compare it with the time that you're going to feed them and see if this, the, the feed will still be okay. So we do not feed the expired products to our beds. Then my last slide for today, feed wastage and feed storage. Yeah, feed wastage is really an issue. 
So number one, we need to make sure that our stocking density is correct. When I say stocking density, we talked about it when I was talking about pot house construction. I said we expect 10 to 12 beds per square meter, meaning during summer, we use 10 beds per square meter. And during winter, we use 12 beds per square meter. So if the stocking density is, is higher than the required, this may lead to feed spillage because the feeder space per bed is reduced, which will lead to increased activities at the feeder. So for example, if we say we need 30 beds per feeder and you increase your stocking density to about 15 beds per square meter. It means your feeder will not be able to cater for 30 beds. Why? Because the number in your pot house has increased. So that same feeder will now be catering maybe for about 35 beds per feeder, which will be too much for one feeder. And at the end of the day, you'll see that there will be more feed spillage in your in your pot house also trophy design design or feeders design let's make sure that all feeder trophies are adjusted as to height normally we say the base of our feeder should be raised up to the back of our beds so that they will not this you will not spill our feed whilst eating. So let's make sure we always raise our feeders. So for other issues that come with not raising feeders, we can talk about them as we go. Not today though, but Mr. Rollins will always share my contacts for those who need my assistance. So let's make sure our trophies are properly designed, they do not spill feed, and also let's raise our feeders according to the requirement. Then monitor flock intake. As a farmer, you need to have a relationship with your flock. You need to have a relationship with your animals. Know how much feed do my chicks or my beds, my beds eat per day. So you would see that someone will tell you that I, I put 25 kgs per day. Why? Because you have noticed if I put 25 kgs of feed, the feed will not, will, the feeders will not be empty as well. The feed will always be there until your next, your next day. So we need to know feed consumption of our bed so that we don't put much. If you put much, this will end up, we will end up wasting our feed. So monitoring the flock intake is very very important. Then we go on our storage. Feed must be stored in a cool, dry place and not directly under sunlight. We need to make sure that our feed is stored in a cool, dry place. Also eliminate rays and mouse, mouse in our storage rooms because rays can spread diseases. We have talked about biosecurities. Rays are also a problem when it comes to spreading of diseases. So we need to make sure we eliminate rays and mouse in our storage rooms. Then prevent feed from rain and moisture. Even during transit or in our storage rooms, let's make sure we don't expose our feet on rains or moisture. Then do not store your feet directly on floor. We need to have pallets or we improvise. At least let's put our feet on top of something or a pallets per se. So we need to at least improvise into something like a pallet so that we do not put our feet directly on the floor. Thank you very much. This is my presentation for today. I know I, I have not talked about anything when it comes to broiler management. There are a lot of things that are involved in order for us to say, wow, we now have a two kgs bed after 35 days, but we will have time to talk about more. We will share contacts to talk about more. To those who have questions, please feel free ask our assist in any way. Thank you very much, Mkoma Rollins. This is my contact, Blantina Mutako, 
from national food my contact details contact number email address feel free to get in touch and my apologies i expect i exceeded 20 minutes because you know when i'm talking about with farmers i take much of my time because i enjoy doing this so please my apologies he had given me 20 minutes but <laughs> anyway thank you i'm giving big time to mr Rowling. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Plantina. Don't worry about the time. Uh, you know, the, the presentation was um, very, very comprehensive. You know, you touched on key issues there, on housing, on health and, uh, and feeding uh, as well. So to our farmers, if you fail to design uh, a proper house, your business is likely to fail. So uh, in case you have already designed your poultry house, we hope you have taken note of the areas that you need to improve in order to maximize. Blantina, there are a lot of questions that we have received here, but you know, after the next pre presenter, we'll you know, do our question and answer uh, session. So also a key takeaway from Blantina, Blantina's uh, presentation is prevention is better than cure. Diseases are a threat to your uh, profit. So take action now to ensure biosecurity. So we now invite our next presenter. She is from Agro Poultry Supplies and Veterinary Services, Noma Moyo. Please, you can uh, go for it. Okay, thank you so much. The name is Noma once again, from Agro Poultry and Veterinary Supplies. So today I'm going to talk to you about poultry equipment and the upkeep of your bed in the bed house. I think Plantina uh, did the most when she touched on housing, which is very important. Um, at Agro Poultry, we do the whole range of feeders and drinkers. May I please go to the next slide? That'll be the next one. Yes, so amongst our products, we're into poultry medicine, poultry vaccines, livestock equipment, livestock medicine, feeders, drinkers, catering material, thermometers, leg rings, and gas brooders. So I'm going to introduce you to our feeders. We have the cheek trays, the oval hinged feeder, the 28 wall, uh, from 3 kg feeder up to the 16 kg ribbed feeder. And I think we're all familiar with these types of feeders, but I'm going to introduce you to the most innovative one that we have. This is the bulk chick feeder. Thank you. So looking at the chick trays and other feeders, the bulk chick feeder is very innovative in the sense that it carries a large capacity for feed and it makes the refilling less labor intensive. It is also ideal for all poultry farmers as it reduces wastage. I think you heard when Plantina was talking about the issue of feed, how you should not give your chicks feed that is spoiled or rotten. The bulk chick feeder is the educator for that. The feeding capacity of our bulk chick feeder is three per hundred beds and you use it from day old chicks up to seven days old. And yet egg poultry and veterinary supplies, we have the five kg feed, bulk chick feeder. And we move on to our next, uh, that's the picture of the bulk, five kg bulk chick feeder. And we move on to the next, I'll then introduce you to our drinkers. We range from the three liter water phones up to the 16 liter. And then we also have the automated, automatic bell drinker, the nipple only drinker and the nipple plus cup drinker. So these are the three uh, drinkers that I'm going to touch on. So the automated, automatic bell drinker is an innovative equipment for providing clean and continuous water supply for poultry. 
Uh, it can provide 24 hour supply of water once connected to a field overhead tank. It's unique and sensitive. And it also serves 50 to 70 beds for each bell drinker. So unlike the three liter ones where you have to keep on refilling, this one is, is sensitive and feeds up to 50 to 70 beds each. It also helps poultry farmers achieve a constant water level without wetting the floor. Because when the floor is wet, it can introduce poultry diseases in the, in the brooder. And we want to avoid that, especially when the chicks are still uh, in the brooding stage. That is two weeks in summer and then three weeks in winter. So the water pressure on the drinker can also be regulated which is something that is innovative, unlike the drinkers that we are used to uh, from time, since time immemorial. And I think the picture of the bell drinker is, we can all see the picture of the bell drinker. And then we move on to our, to the nipple drinker. Okay, the nipple drinker can also be found when it can also be used in with, with the with the bell drinker. A one nipple drinker serves 12 to 18 beds, but now we have the nipple drinkers and sorry, very sorry. We have the nipple drinker and the nipple drinking system. The nipple drinker is fully automated they, and they are fully, there are different variants of nipple drinkers. We have the nipple drinker with the cup and we have the nipple drinker with cup and with detachable attachment. They are easy to save water to chickens, unlike the, the drinkers that we, we used back then where we have to continuously go back into their brooder or house uh, to, to make sure that the chicks have constant supply of water. And it saves additional space and accommodate more chickens. And it's easy on oral medication and vaccination of beds as well. I think you can all see the picture of the nipple drinker. I hope it's clear to everyone. After we've touched on the feeders and the drinkers, it is also important to focus on the heating solutions during brooding. So we have the infrared lamp, we've got charcoal, and some farmers prefer to use the gas brooder. So for charcoal, I think Blantina mentioned that you have to have adequate charcoal and for the infrared lamp, it has to be enough as the infrared lamp accommodates for a hundred chicks. At agro poultry, we have then introduced the gas brooder. Uh, this gas brooder now, um, during this winter, is available to you farmers as it is an all time, it provides an all time uniform temperature. Unlike the charcoal where you have to make sure you monitor whereby you have. Okay, it seems we are having some uh, connectivity challenge with uh, Norma. Uh, I think she'll try and uh, reconnect. And whilst we are waiting for her to to reconnect, maybe we can now go into our uh, question and answer. We need to touch on the questions that you have been sending us through our comment section and also our chat section. So if you have uh, any question, please do send us through um, uh, the chat. Okay. So the first one, I think it's for Blantina. It's saying here, what can you do if you don't have enough space to build on the east to west orientation? Can you still build on the north to south 
and then use curtains. So uh, the first thing that you need to understand is why are we building the pot house in an east to west orientation? The main reason is we do not need direct sunlight into our pot house. So we block our sunlight from the east as it, as, as it rises up and during the dawn when it goes down, we block the, um, the other side. So if we do not do that, it means the sunlight now it goes directly into our pottery house, which will then affect number one, our temperature. Number two, this will also affect feed intake of our beds because our beds will now go and squat in a corner where the sunlight is coming through. So if that happens, it means more time is going to be spent whilst they are squat in a corner than feeding. Yet we want to achieve two kgs plus in five weeks. So to avoid that, we must, it's a must build our pot house in an east to west orientation. Even if you put some catering, you'd find that at some point the sun will definitely go through your, your pot house. So we do not want that for our beds. We only need an east to west orientation so that we block sunlight from both sides that it comes through. And during midday, the sun will now go over our, our roof. Things. So we should not affect our beds by by that. So it's unfortunately, <laughs> I have to teach you the right thing, and so that we do the project in a much productive and much profitable way. It's east to west orientation only. Thank you. Thank you uh, for taking that one, uh, Blantina. Then uh, the next. Uh, question is uh, for Agro. Unfortunately, I think we have lost uh, Norma. She's trying to rejoin. Uh, we'll move on to the third question. It's with this type of housing, in the event that it's raining, won't the beds be affected by rains from the north and south ends, which are wide open? Maybe in the event of raining, we can use plastic, but I'm not saying to use plastic as catering. I'm saying use plastic when it's raining, but as we know, it doesn't rain from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. It will break. And so during that time of rains, we just put plastic. When the rain stops, let's drop down the plastics and leave our catering of sex on. I think for now this can this can help, but we do not need plastics in catering. We only use plastic in the event of rain. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Blantina, for answering that one. Uh, then another question is: uh, It's unfortunate on the multi-edge one. I don't know if this is a question or a comment. Uh, it's unfortunate. In the multi on the multi edge uh, one, or oh, okay, that uh, that point you mentioned, uh, it means continuity in supply is disrupted, and the next time you have a batch, customers are gone. I think uh, not really. Comment, yeah. Not not. It de it depends on how big is your project. Number one, and how how do you how do you okay how friendly are you? I know farmers you don't want to say. Um, we don't want to share our customers, but we also need to consider this when we are living in a society, you don't get successful on your own. You need people to hold hands with so that you are successful. So if you have a capacity number one, maybe you can use some freezers. If you afford, you can invest in your freezers so that you can freeze your chickens and make sure that you have an ongoing power, power that can freeze your chickens. And whilst you are resting, because there's an issue of resting your pottery houses, there is no way you are going to do continuous production without stopping. Why? Because we also have resting period for our pottery houses, which is again very important and which we will talk about in other trainings or meetings to come. So maybe you need to, you might consider in investing in a freezer or you can have your friends or your fellow farmers that you can, you can hold hands together and 
continuously supply if blood sinner supplies this week then whilst mr m's pot house is resting mr n is supplying then it comes back to blood sinner something like that farmers let's work together let's let's we, we do this together you get the sense we need to hold each other's hands so that we we grow and along doing that we need to make sure we are sticking to proper management what we require for our beds to come out in a good and expected way. So, yeah, some things we can't do away with. We cannot do as much as we want continuous production, but it will affect you in some way if you do that. You end up losing a batch of 1,000 beds just because I need to continuously supply. And at the end of the day, there will be no supply either way. So these are the things that we need to be to be much more careful and look into without making some other decisions and knowing the consequences of doing that. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Blantina, for answering that one. And uh, the following is just a comment I'll read as it is. It's um, on multi-age groups. Um, you just got me there today because I'm planning or I was planning to divide my fowl and to accommodate my new batch. Uh, yeah, that was just a, a comment. So thanks for, you know, uh, shedding more light on the issue of multi-age uh, groups. Then the next uh, question is for Agro. Uh, I see uh, Noma is back now. So maybe in, uh, Noma, we were now in the question and answer uh, session of our webinar. Um, the question we have here for you is, uh, does Agro do battery cages for layers? Okay, thank you so much. My apologies for the internet glitch there. Yes, we do battery cages. We have the 48 bed, the 64 bed, the 96 and the 128. Okay, uh, thanks for answering uh, that one. Then the next one is may we have agro contact details. I think on your presentation, there was a slide with the contact details. I will also try and yes. share from this. Thank you so much. Then another question here is, where can we get the reasonably priced gas brooders as the cost of gas is high, though reliable than uh, Zesa? Um, maybe yeah, you can contact uh, Agro directly for the, the prices for their rudders and other equipment that you need. Uh, Godfrey, uh, your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I asked a question which you didn't read, but basically it has to do with uh, size. Um, it's like my question was, but for the size for different age groups and different uh, batches, um, will rooms uh, do? And uh, if at all, we, can, we are allowed to use uh, different rooms or what distance between the houses, the, the base houses is permissible? Okay, thank you for the question. We need a distance of about 30 meters between each poultry house to the other. 30 meters from one poultry house to another. What we don't want is the same house accommodates five different age groups of beds. Okay, thank you. So, and for road runners, we say one kilometer apart. If it's road runner and broilers at the same farm, now we are talking of a big farm, we need a kilometer apart, it's either a kilometer from broiler to road runner or a kilometer from broiler to layers. Then uh, it's which option is better to use between gas, charcoal, and infrared lights? I think it's for ego. Okay, so we are saying charcoal is cost effective if you are a large scale farmer and gas brooders are cost effective if you are a small scale farmer with the beds ranging from 300 to 500 or 1000 beds. Then infrared lamps are for those backyard farmers who, who, who have about 50 to 100 beds. 
this marks the end of our webinar. We would like to appreciate uh, and to thank Norma and Blantina for joining us uh, and for uh, sharing the key uh, information and issues uh, in areas that uh, we can improve and ensure that we are running sustainable broiler farm businesses. And we hope uh, you have benefited. So to our participants, thank you very much for joining this webinar. And we uh, hope that you have benefited from the great presentations uh, by uh, Blantina and uh, Norma. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great day, everybody. From Agribusiness Media, I am Rolling Coffee. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.